let's go ahead and kick this off. Um, today, we're going to be talking about, as mentioned, how to design and optimize an onboarding plan. Uh, we do some really quick introductions, and then we're going to go through uh, these sort of five key areas that go into optimizing and designing that plan um, that we're talking about that you're ultimately going to put in front of customers to help them make progress towards their goals. So we're going to talk about that first of all. How do you get aligned on the outcomes that the customer is actually trying to reach? How do you discover those? How do we, you document those? And ultimately, how do you align the plan to those? Uh, we'll go into mapping the plan, mapping the process that you're going to go through uh, with your customers to get them from where they are today to that successful outcome that they're looking for. Uh, we'll talk about optimizing the plan to drive action. This is one thing that we, we hear a lot, that we talk with our customers uh, at Arrows uh, about a lot, uh, which is, you know, how do you actually get people to do the things that they need to do in order to be successful? So about how do you introduce that plan? How do you communicate that plan? Uh, that you're going to put in front of customers to them? How do you set expectations? How do you make sure um, that the plan is, is being communicated effectively and is ultimately going to actually have the impact that you're hoping for? Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about talk a little bit about data. How do you, how do you measure? How do you report uh, on the performance of an onboarding plan? So first up, uh, really quick introductions. I'm Stuart Balcom. I run marketing here at Arrows where we build customer facing onboarding plans that attach to deals or tickets inside of HubSpot. The whole point there being that the customer facing plan is designed to drive action and give your team the ability to run everything, their existing process, get all the data for reporting, automations, everything that they are already doing uh, inside of HubSpot. And I'm joined by Sherelle Narriman, who is head of customer success at Arrows and has previously built and scaled onboarding teams at places like Sprout Social and Booking.com. Hey, Sherelle. Howdy. And hey, everyone. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's get into it really quickly. Why should you even care about onboarding? Like, why, why are we all here? Why is optimizing and designing your onboarding plan uh, so important? Well, first of all, most companies honestly aren't that great at onboarding. And most customers think that companies can do better. Um, and there's also a real business impact for or of improving onboarding. Uh, the better your onboarding experience, the more likely, uh, and the better that experience and support is sort of after somebody has closed, the more likely they are to A, choose to go with you, in the first place, but ultimately expand, grow their usage, grow their revenue, and really look to you as a trusted solver of problems in their business. Um, and then this is something that we say a lot at Arrows, um, but retention and expansion really does start on day one. It's really hard to retain and expand uh, a customer who had a really poor experience or wasn't set up for success from the get-go. So building an onboarding process that helps customers get from where they are today, why they signed up, to the outcomes that they want to get to quickly and in a in a way that matches their expectations is great sort of all around and has longer term benefits in the life cycle. So let's get into the topics of this webinar. I'm going to switch over to, I'm going to drive uh, the screen. I'm going to hand this over to Sherelle, who's going to sort of talk through um, the, the different topics that we have here. And so we're going to build a plan in real time, essentially. We're going to, well, we're going to rebuild a plan in uh, in real time and sort of talk through uh, why and some of the principles uh, behind what we're doing. So I'm going to jump into, we're going to use Arrows, uh, the product to do this, uh, but really these principles apply however you're putting a pl an onboarding plan in front of customers. So I'm going to switch to the plan and hand over to Sherelle to, to get into why is aligning on customer outcomes as the starting point for your onboarding plan so important? Generally, why it's so important is because most of us, us here at Arrows included, and you all probably included, don't have the best process in place. And that's not a dig at anybody, that's just the reality. There are multiple handoffs behind the scenes. You're using different tools to move customers from marketing to sales to onboarding to success to so on. Um, you have a ton of goals internally. You have your own metrics. You have your own business metrics that you're trying to hit. You have your own internal goals for onboarding. You have your own definition of what value and success looks like. All of those things are important and they all are going to exist and they should all be behind the scenes and not necessarily be the customer facing thing. So where aligning on goals becomes critical is because that is the customer facing component of this whole chaos that's happening behind the scenes. 
that's the thing they came to you or me in the first place for. That's what they're paying us for. It's their outcomes. Psychologically also, if you get someone to their desired outcomes sooner than later, that primes them and gives you the actual environment to be able to then hit all of your other goals, to talk about all those premium upgrades, to talk about all those features that your product team is excited about building and wants you to talk about. It's just not the right time. So the sooner you can align on those initial goals, it serves one, a purpose for all, everything I just described and, and keeping that kind of on the back burner and getting customers focused on what is their actual thing. It also gives you a better starting point to hit one of those outcomes that the customer's already aligned to instead of trying to hit all of these other things that have to happen anyway. They just don't have to happen this very second. So it gives you a, a faster place to start from. We say all the time onboarding never ends. That's not to say don't time box it. That's not to say don't add expectations. In fact, do that and do it well. Tell customers it's gonna take three calls, tell them it's gonna take four weeks, tell them it's gonna be these steps. But also realize you don't have to jam everything into there. You can do that in month two and month three and month four. So what do you need to do in month one? It's those things that customers are telling you are their outcomes. And what Stuart is showing here is an example of a welcome message. This is the first place a customer lands when they engage with one of our plans. And really what we're trying to do here is emphasize, why did you just pay us all this money to work with us? And why am I sending you all this homework and things to work about? Well, it's because generally your goals are to reduce churn by the end of Q1 and your goals are to increase reporting um believing in your reporting and having better reporting and better metrics and better numbers so that you can ultimately have a story to tell about that churn or i.e. how well your program is going. So these, we have heard enough from our customers that these are kind of the general goals that most people come to us to. The piece where it's aligned to their needs is that 15% and the quarter. So you can start with a generic goal of everyone probably wants to reduce churn. That's why most people now care about onboarding. This customer specifically wants to reduce it by 15%. To them, that's kind of the sweet spot, and they want to do it within this time frame. So if you don't have these um, super fine details about a customer just yet, that's okay. Start with the generic outcomes, reduce churn, and increase churn reporting. Then when I have you that kickoff call, or I read the sales notes, or better yet, have a sales rep ask that question and put that in a, in a field somewhere so I have access to it, now I can customize it to their goals. Now, if I'm the customer and I open this, I'm gonna be quickly reminded, oh, this is why I'm paying these folks, this is why I need to schedule this call, this is why I need to do my homework, i.e. all the tasks you're about to dump on their lap to complete. This is the serving, or this is the reminder that that serves as a purpose to say, here is why we're going to do all these things. These are your goals, not necessarily my goals, although in turn they are now my goals. So that's a long answer to what seems like a very simple topic, but that alignment is so, so, so critical because it is that starting point that you can then build off of. And it in, in turn does make both parties' lives easier because yes, we have to do all this stuff anyway, but for right now, we have to do these things. And if I can get you to do these things, we now have data that shows you are far more inclined to come back and do the next thing and do the advanced version. And eventually you are not churning at the rate you were churning at. And we have data to now show all this and you're primed to grow more. And that all points back to really aligning initially on that goal. Plus now every time you have a QBR or a next check-in or a renewal conversation, you're confirming the goals instead of asking them again. Is, is your goal still, or, or better yet, did we reduce churn by 15% in quarter one? If not, what does that look like for quarter two? If not, what does that look like for quarter three? If not, so on and so on and so on. Also, what new goals do you have? I've already proven to you that I can, that I can help you align and hit your first goals or desired outcomes. What's next in order for you? So a very um, simple step on paper, but if not skipped, it has tremendous upstream value for you because it does help you then craft a better template, i.e. a better process and actually make movement. Yeah, I think a big thing to to note here too is is being having that goal and even knowing what it is is of, is of course important, but having it documented in a shared place is really impactful because it means you can reference it in everything you do, right? If you set a due date or a, you know, we want to get this, this particular, or this individual task in our plan completed by X date, um, and it doesn't happen, or it's coming up to that date and it's getting closer, you need to communicate and, and sort of re-engage a customer maybe, 
you can reference this goal, right? You can say, well, we said that we wanted to do this by the end of Q1 in order mm-hmm. to do that. Uh, you know, we need to go live. We need to have this earlier dependency complete by this date. Let's make sure that you know we're showing the ultimate goal that we're trying to reach and referencing that whenever we're trying to do any of the individual steps along the way. Um, and sort of keeping that bigger picture there can be can be really helpful because some products and I mean not every product has a perfectly self serve, really simple to set up, takes two clicks and you're you're away uh, type of process. Um, and onboarding is of course much more than just the sort of configuration and, and setup of of the product, but sometimes it will take a little bit of time and setting that expectation up front uh, about how long it will take is one thing, but also making sure that it's clear that the reason we're doing all this work is to get to this goal that we have um, can be really exactly. impactful and, and help drive action at a sort of higher level than we'll talk about with some specific tactics uh, in a little bit. Um, so let's get into mapping the process. So once you have this, uh, A, you have a space in your plan to document the shed or the outcomes that your customer is trying to reach, and you're, you're going ahead and you have a process for, for discovering and, and doing that with each customer. What's next? Like, how do you go about building out uh, a plan? That's funny. Uh, that there's, this is a template uh, <laughs> which we're going to build in here, uh, but there's nothing in it because this is our, our starting point. It's funny that it says that it was complete. Um, so how would you go about mapping out the process, Sherelle, for somebody who you know, maybe already has... So they were, they're already running onboarding with customers. They already have uh, some some steps that they work through. Uh, how would you think about sort of mapping that out and building that into a you know defined, documented uh, process that they can work with? Yeah, great question. Um, by the way, if if folks you have questions, drop them in the chat as we go. I'm keeping an eye on that too, and we can kind of answer in real time. Or if you have stuff that's specific to your business, um, what I like to do is so these are planned templates by design. And what that means is you can have multiple of them. So what I like to start with is now that you have a sense of those aligned outcomes, basically what do I need to do to get you to get to that aligned outcome? Um, You have most of these thoughts or or steps already in your head and or you're doing them if you don't have them documented. If you have them documented, great. But at the highest level and what Stuart's doing here is really starting with just steps. So don't worry as much about the order, about is it the right task or not, just start writing down the things that have to happen in those early stages. So most businesses are charging something, right? And and in order to start onboarding or implementation, you have to pay your invoice. You then have to schedule some sort of kickoff call or, or meeting where you discuss that. Um, if you are gathering information from people, like what is their process in in the arrows world we have people send us those documents or their thoughts and we collect that information up front so tell us about that join the call start building your actual template we're going to review the template together these are generic steps um they're not in any specific order per se nor are they in any specific phase or category of steps so whether you're using an arrows template or a word doc or a spreadsheet this is this kind of reminds me of when you're putting together a deck, like a presentation. I don't know about you all. I'm very guilty of spending so much time on things like clip art or emojis or the right title for a slide when none of it actually matters. It's it's the it's the description and the thing that I need to get to. So don't worry about that piece of it. In here, just write down the steps. So Stuart's listed out a seven or eight different steps that we know has to happen for us to get started. Now. Once you have that list, that laundry list of things in your head, um, you have a process ultimately mapped out. Is it a good process? That's still to be determined. Is it the right order? That's to be determined. Is it the right time in that journey? That's to be determined. But you have all the steps. Once you have those steps, a, a quick validation is, one, is this a real task? Like, am I asking someone to actually do something? Or is this a optional thing like go watch this video, go read this article, go and those are fine too. But those are not bad tasks. They just might be presented at the wrong time or in the wrong uh, moment in that customer's life cycle. So put it all on paper. Now you have this process here. Now the question to ask yourself is do these all align to those initial goals or outcomes? And in, in our case, they do. So we're gonna keep these here. 
pay your invoice is probably not the name for this phase. Um, maybe this is a getting started phase. So now that you have some of those steps, you can come in here and start to adjust some of that. So most people have a getting started point. Don't overthink it, call it getting started. You can get cute and name it something later. Um, then ask yourself, are all of these tasks actually part of my getting started phase? Pay your invoices, schedule your call is, tell us about your current processes, con join that kickoff call probably is. Then we're thinking about like configuring a template. That's probably not any longer the getting started phase for me. It's a new phase. So let's just call it something basic like template configuration. Now you have a new category of phases or steps that are about to come. In our case, because this is dynamic, you can just drag those phases from above or those tasks from above and drop them in this new phase. So now you're starting to build a timeline, i.e. expectations for customers as to what is about to happen after we align on those goals. So you have to get started. Here's a couple things you need to do. Then you have to start doing a piece of setup. This is the template configuration in our case. And then eventually what we're going to do in our case is review or go into advanced configuration for you. Um, to do that though, you need to send an actual plan. And to send an actual plan, you need to build your template. And to build your template, you have to put these steps on paper. So what we're trying to do is get you to what our first value moment is, which is where you now have a template, i.e. a process inside of Arrows, where you can look at it and think to yourself, oh, this looks nice. I'm ready to put this in front of a customer. We're calling that the go live phase, if you will. Um, so at this point, what we want you to do is send that first plan. This whole thing takes about a week's amount of time, by the way. Um, it can also take three months amount of time. Why I say it's a week, because I actually want you to build the first version of your template. And so as I'm speaking out loud, if Stuart opens that template configuration phase, and now I'm getting a little bit into the details, but one thing I notice is configure your templates when I actually need you to configure a template. And I might even get more specific and say, configure this type of template. Then I can use the descriptions for that. So what, what I'm getting to is the core um, strategy that we think about when it comes to education, which is teaching people how to do things, but also why to do them. So teaching someone how to build a template really needs to happen one time. It's, as you can see here, it's pretty straightforward. Type in your task names, eventually we'll add descriptions and actions to a task. But then what I look for is moments where a customer might get stuck. And where they might get stuck is usually where you've put too many tasks into a singular step. So telling someone to configure all their templates in a single step is a lot. Someone might have one template, someone might have 20 templates. Now I have increased the chances that someone's going to get stuck there. But if I teach you how to build your first template, you can build your second, third, fourth, fifth, 20th on your own. So what I really want to do is get you to build your first template because that's what we're gonna be able to send a plan off of. That's essentially getting you to that point of being able to go live. Then we will go into HubSpot and configure things for automation, for process, for roadmaps, for pipelines, for reports, for all those things that come as an advantage of using something like Arrows because it's heavily integrated. I used to, to give you a, a real life example of how this used to work at Arrows, I used to actually have HubSpot configuration as the second task up here because it's a big value add. Once you have reports and dashboards and analytics, which we'll show a little bit of, that's huge. That's what a lot of people are paying us money for. But that is literally not possible until you create a template and send a plan because that's the data that's powering all these reports. So I used to do it to show off Arrows' capabilities, but I actually realized customers weren't making progress towards, this, was, this is a good example of a selfish goal I had versus a customer aligned outcome. They just wanna send a plan. They wanna take their process and put it in a, in a template and send it to a customer. So what I did was move down my HubSpot configuration to a later phase. I want you to know that I'm gonna do this thing and that I'm responsible to do it. And what I've learned is I'm gonna go in and do it while you are building your template because I don't need you to build your template necessarily. I know there's about 40 data points that make up what you're seeing in front of you. I know you're gonna use 10 of those to pretty much put together your first report, your first dashboard, your first analytics inside of a pipeline. So while you're doing your template building, I'm going into HubSpot and configuring those pieces for you on your end. And what that also does psychologically is it's really ingraining that why piece of it. 
So why would I go work on my template and why would I get it to a point to send it to a customer? Because these reports can then start to be powered, because these dashboards can start to be powered, because these automations will get going. So psychologically, what I'm also doing is starting to ingrain arrows into your day to day because you now log into HubSpot and you will see those properties, you will see those pipelines, you will see those dashboards. So now I have a second reminder as to why you need to go do your homework, which is build your template and send that first plan. The first is your goals. The second is these data points that are ultimately going to answer the questions for you, like is churn reducing by 15% in Q1? Are we seeing a reduction in um, or an increase in revenue? Are we seeing a reduction in onboarding time? And so on. So. At the highest level, we started with just a list of tasks, then we started to group them into categories. And now you wanna add some details for those tasks, which will also start to answer the question of, is this actually a task and should I be putting it in front of a customer? Now, what Stuart is showing here is the anatomy of an arrows task, but generally these things should be a part of your steps to, to consider. So if you're telling someone to do something, where do they do it and what is the thing? That's why we have descriptions here. So schedule your calls, pretty straightforward. Use this calendar link to schedule a call. In the arrows case, I can embed information right into the task. And so what I want to remind people always is the why. Like, why should you come to this call with me? Because we're gonna confirm your goals, the ones that we have aligned on. We're gonna review your process together. We're gonna cover what's about to happen next and we're gonna schedule all of our future reviews calls and check-in calls and template calls, all those things that you were just promised on in sales and in marketing. Um, now, the next component of, a, of the task is how to do it when or where to do it, and then it's who and when, right? So every task we let you assign to an individual person, whether that's a role, we have roles on each plan, and we let you set due dates. We also allow things like relative due dates and roles for this because this speeds up the process of actually rolling this out. So when you do use this template or this task, it will find who the point person is or the main point of contact and assign this task to them. It'll look at the day you started this plan and it'll assign a due date two days after that for this task. So now in this one step, a person can truly do the entire action of scheduling their call. They're, they know what it is. We need to schedule your kickoff call. They know why. There's a description here of what's gonna be covered. They know where to do it. We've embedded this HubSpot calendar link right into this task that you can engage, find dates that work for you and so on. So you don't even have to leave this task. They know who's responsible for it. That's the person it's assigned to. And they know by when this needs to be done. So it covers all five of those bases really quickly in one step. And when a customer comes in here and books their time, this whole thing is interactive now because it's embedded fully in here. This is exact view a customer would see. They pick their time, they mark this task complete, and now I also know that they have done their thing. Um, if they wanted to reschedule it, they could. If they wanted to assign it to someone else, they could. If they wanted to drop a comment in there, they could. And you just go now through these tasks and start adding details and giving people a place to do it. So you're taking that generic skeleton of a process and starting to add some of those details. The Another pro tip we've learned through data and through experience is there's usually two reasons people get stuck in, in any process from point A to point B. The first is that tasks aren't clear. So as you do this and you're asking yourself, is this really a task? Why are people getting stuck here? Some tangible signs there are. If you go name a task and then now you have 10 bullet points inside of that task description, you probably have more than one task. You're trying to jam too many things into a single step. Customers will get stuck there or at least it'll slow things down. Um, so it's the first opportunity is always to look inwards and ask yourself, was this a clear process? Did I give clear instructions? Is it really a task? Like viewing a video is a task, but is that video relevant to what I need to do next or what I need to do now more importantly than next? Because if not, maybe it's a distraction more than it is a task. And that doesn't mean it's not valuable. That doesn't mean don't go do help center content and articles and videos. In fact, do more of them just figure out when to sprinkle them in and when to introduce them. So whenever someone gets stuck, unpack the task. Is it out of order? Is it is it our internal bias? I might think setting up a template is super easy, but now Stuart is 15 clicks in and he's annoyed and he's lost in my settings and he's lost in setup and it wasn't as easy as I thought. So there's a lot of internal bias that goes in. A way to gut check this is build this process and put it in front of someone who isn't on your customer facing team. Go talk to a product marketer, go talk to a sales rep, go, to, or go talk to someone on product, um, talk to a friend, 
send it to yourself. Put yourself in those customers' shoes and, and remove some of that bias. The second most common place people get stuck is ultimately where you're sending them. So usually that's in the product or in the service, and that's usually a UI challenge or a design challenge or something like that. So first look at the step and the process, then if a customer keeps getting stuck, look at where you're sending them. And that's a, a quick means to get yourself some data to also go give product feedback or product requests to your engineering teams. Um, so. If you're looking at this, you've sent it to 10 people, eight of them have gotten stuck on tell us about your current process. There's probably something wrong with that task. You probably need to clarify the instructions. Maybe you have the wrong task in there. Maybe you have the wrong action assigned to it. Maybe you have a due date that's unrealistic. It takes customers 10 days to actually gather all this and send it over and you're asking them to do it in two days and now it's failed and you have discouraged them from making progress. So it's things like that you can start to unpack. Um, same with like, I, I see this common hurdle where people will say, go read this article, which in and of itself is great, but then they send me to a landing page where there's 10 articles to read and one or two of them are related to the topic at hand, but there's eight other ones and my personality and my brain now is stuck because I want to either read all those or save them for later or basically not make any more progress until I know that I can or can't do that. Um, as you lay these out, they don't necessarily have to be in chronological order, depending on your process. So if there's a world where I explained like I'm working on HubSpot setup while you're working on template setup, I like to expose both of those things. We also do give the function or the option in every, in every um, template to turn on what we call sequential phasing, which ultimately means we will hide all future phases until that first one is completed. So what this does, and this is this is common too. I'll see folks that have a hundred steps in their onboarding process and it feels overwhelming or they're self-conscious about, is it too many things? No, my answer is usually no. You, If those things have to be done, they have to be done. But do you need your customers to feel overwhelmed and worry about all of those today? Probably not, that in itself can be overwhelming. So as you can see now, all we do is expose these first four tasks. And once a customer went through this plan and completed those, we would then expose the next set of tasks and the next set of tasks and the next set of tasks. So I still like to, on my kickoff call, show this because you wanna set expectations. You wanna let customers know this is gonna take six months or not six months, hopefully. This is gonna take six weeks. Um, maybe it does take six months. That's okay. Here's how we're gonna get there. Here's the next set of tasks, the next set of phases. Here are due dates. Here's stuff we'll get to eventually. For now, just focus on these first set of tasks. Um, you can also build things like internal tasks, as you all probably have and know. There are steps that you need to do internally that have to happen for the process to continue. And then there are steps that you need to do that you want customers to be aware of. And then there are steps customers have to do. So now the way Stuart structured that last task is it's actually an internal, completely internal task to us. And what we're letting customers know here, again, through expectation setting is, you have to worry about paying your invoice, scheduling your call, telling us your process and granting us access. We have to do something behind the scenes. Just know that this responsibility falls on our shoulders. You don't need to worry about what it even is. Just know that you have to worry about this stuff. This also acts as a security gate now, which will never unlock that other phase until I go physically do that thing. So if I wanted to add some guardrails in my process, which I encourage you do if it does become one of those overwhelming or bigger tasks or bigger um, project plans, you can build in these kind of guardrails either in, in an arrows plan or in your own process. Just don't send the follow-up email until you're ready to do those next things. So always set expectations with timelines and due dates and the whole process of what's about to happen and then leverage things like internal tasks, communicating at the right time to a customer, um, determining which steps need to be in front of them or not to help reduce that feeling of overwhelm or so much going on because most of us do advertise on marketing and on sales. This thing is going to make your life easier. It's super fast to set up. It's quick to deploy. All those things are probably true once your platform is up and running, but don't shy away from this piece of the process. Um, so you saw pretty quickly here I mean, we obviously know this process pretty well, but this is a new process to us even for a, for about a month now. Um, and what we do once we have one of these templates crafted is we actually make a copy of it. And then as I'm onboarding new customers or my team is onboarding new customers, 
if I learn things, so if I find myself adding the same task to five out of six customers, that's probably something that needs to be part of my bigger process and in my template. So I'll always keep a separate template going. Um, and I, I have a cadence of like every month pretty much launching a new process, which sounds insane and it sounds like a lot of work and it sounds overwhelming, but it's really not because I'm doing it in real time. So by the time the end of the month comes, I've already kind of learned from those current onboardings. I've tweaked a few things in my process. By now, most of these steps I know are the right ones. It's just a matter of, do I need to arrange their order? Do I need to add more descriptions? Do I need to reduce stuff? Um, the other side of it is, I said, by now I know that. That's true for the current state of Eros. We are adding new features. We are adding new pillars. We are adding new capability. So all of those eventually might become steps that someone has to do initially. So I have another template going where I'm, I'm changing things like that. Or those are upstream events that happen. Um, the other thing I love about this, if customers continue to get stuck, and this is not, don't take this as a means, or, or maybe do take it as, as this, but what I'm not trying to say is go point fingers internally and blame other people for parts of the process being broken. But if there is a moment where you find that the same customers or the customers coming from the same sales rep continue to get stuck on a single step, unpack that a little bit. Is that one individual setting unrealistic expectations with customers and that's why they're all getting stuck there? That's less to point fingers, that's more to provide feedback and improve parts of the process that happen earlier and earlier and earlier in the life cycle proactively so that by the time they get to your onboarding calls, by the time they even get to your sales demos, by the time they get to your success check-ins and renewal conversations, you're spending far less time on all that how-to stuff because it is being instilled through your marketing, through your marketing website, through your sales demos, and you're spending more time on the strategy, on the why to stuff, on digging into their goals and their outcomes and so on. And over time, the more you do that proactively, the, and, and I tell this to folks all the time, things like arrows aren't going to replace your humans. Things like process generally isn't gonna replace your humans but it will make your humans far more efficient and far more effective and it'll make their time more valuable. And over time, yes, maybe that reduces the number of people needed to run a process, but it makes those people far more efficient during that process. Um, and now you have the data to prove that, right? So the other huge, huge, huge advantage of taking the time to build a process and map this out, all the obvious ones we just talked about, better customer experience, improving feedback internally, building process as you go and optimizing process as you go. But now you also have data to go prove if you're a, if you're a team leader on this call or if you're an individual contributor who feels like they have too much work on their plate, you actually have the data to go prove that thing now. And you can use that for hiring, you can use that for um, scaling your team conversations. If you're a leader, you can start to answer the question of, what does output look like per individual on a team in terms of getting customers to actually hit their goals? So it seems um, it seems like a, a stretch to think about that from the initial state of mapping out something like an onboarding process, but all these things start to compound and all these lessons learned from each task then starts to answer a whole new set of questions, lets you automate things. Um, yes, you can, with, with Arrows and HubSpot, you can automate, everything I'm pretty much showing you from creating the plan, sending the plan, figuring out where they are in the process. But I highly encourage people to not start everything in an automated world because everyone wants to jump to that and have full in-app onboarding and full automation. By all means, strive for that, make that your North Star. But where you really learn and where you really start to improve process is what is the most annoying manual thing I'm doing today? How do we optimize that one thing at a time? Eventually, if you're doing this continuously, and this is why we say onboarding never ends, both from the lens of educating customers, but also from the lens of improving your process internally over and over and over again, which in and of itself feels very daunting, but it's not because what we showed you in this last 30 minutes is literally all those things. It's creating a process, it's optimizing the process, it's changing things around in there. Um, it's never done anyway. so. There is no version of this template that's perfect. Don't even have that thought in your mind or strive for it because it's not a thing. Instead, focus on a process, start with that, align it to those initial outcomes and goals that customers are telling you for, and then learn from that quickly. Are, they, are these the right tasks? If people are completing them, odds are they are. 
every single person is going to learn differently. So again, you're now battling adult learning styles and you're thinking through different personalities. Not everyone is going to check every task off. Not everyone is going to respond to every email. Not everyone is going to complete every single task the way you want. But if more people than not are doing it, you can view that as a successful part of your process. And if people, more people than not are not doing that thing or getting stuck or, or landing in those gaps, optimize that. Doing those things over and over and over again a little bit at a time, you'll, you'll be shocked at how quickly now you have a process that is actually smooth and is working and does feel optimized. Um, and then you have the qualitative answers to that, like drop a survey at the end of this or an MPS survey or a CSAT survey or something, or just a simple question of, did this onboarding help you achieve the goals you thought you were going to achieve initially? Like that is all. We, we have another session where we get deep into running customer success inside of HubSpot and thinking about health scores and prioritizations and all that. Like at its most basic form, this starts to give you a look into customer health. Are they doing the things that they said they would? Is that helping them achieve their goals? If both of those are yes, you can chop that up as a small win. Um, it's not done again, right? So you're going to change it, you're going to optimize it, you're going to add more, you're going to remove stuff, but you're starting to get leading indicators of is it working, which we all need that pat on the back. We all need to know that process is working a little bit. Um, that in itself is encouraging to keep going on your process and on your optimization and mapping this out. And again, over time, you are now building, you're using this, you're, you're changing this as you go, and you're continuing to improve, hopefully, that customer experience. Yeah, I think one of the huge things here and something that we talk about a lot uh, internally is, is establishing your own baseline, right? Like once you have a process that's documented and you have customers who are making progress and, and using that process um, to, to be onboarded, and that's the process that you're running with customers, you immediately have data, right? And obviously, depending on how you're putting that plan in front of customers will uh, determine you know, how easy it is to get that data, how consistent it is, that kind of thing. Um, but once you have a baseline, you can be iterative and you can improve against that baseline, right? There's no, you can look at all the benchmark metrics or the, you know, the average metrics for an industry, but ultimately the data that matters and the benchmark that matters is your own. And are you improving against that, uh, against that starting point? Um, because I think from there, as Shro mentioned, like you can look for those little optimizations. You can, you can look for specific choke points or specific roadblocks that customers are, are running into and optimize that first. Um, and then sort of over time, you end up with a, a much smoother, much more, uh, optimized plan that ultimately is getting customers to their goals, but but also helping you hit your own internally as well. So one final sort of thing to show is we can show a little bit of the, the data side. Um, as Shul's mentioned a couple of times here, Arrow's plans uh, connect to HubSpot. So if I open one of these plans, uh, hopefully it is a, a good example, inside of HubSpot, you can just get a, a quick example of that. So an Arrows plan, uh, when you have Arrows, the app installed in your HubSpot account, um, you have this card over on the right-hand side, which gives sort of a you know pro progress through the plan. What is the current thing that we're working on? When's it due? Who's it assigned to? Um, in this case, I'm overdue. Um, and you know, at a glance, like where are we in this plan? The big advantage of having a, an onboarding plan or having a customer-facing plan that is connected to where all of your other customer data lives is that you can combine that information in reporting and automations and customer communications and give everybody who's involved with that customer whether they're you know you on your onboarding team the others on your onboarding and success teams or other people elsewhere in the journey right whether it's a sales rep who closed the deal and is is wondering how that customer is doing in onboarding you sort of increase that visibility and increase the the number of people and the ability of people to help you improve the process help you improve uh, the experience that the customer is having through their life cycle. Um, so not only do you have this uh, sort of summary over here, you can also push back, like as I mentioned, I think 40 data points um, or in that ballpark uh, about what is actually happening in the plan into HubSpot properties, which allows you to do interesting things um, and helpful things from a uh, reporting perspective uh, of very quickly getting a, an overview of where everybody else, where everybody is in their plans, where are they tracking relative to their target dates, uh, how long have they been on, on tasks. So what, what are some of the things, I know these are, uh, or variations of these, uh, these reports are things that you're using 
with Arrow's customers? Like, what, what are some of the things that you look for in these reports? Like, when you look at optimizing the process or sort of sharing information about how onboarding is going to others in the company, like, what are some of the things that you look for and, like, where what stands out to you about reporting on onboarding in this way? Yeah, the first, the first thing I always try to solve for, and this is probably my... Um my 10 year background and bias towards customer success and onboarding teams, not usually getting the right visibility or the right tooling or the right um, seat at the table is exactly that. Play, creating a place or a report or a dashboard where now everyone can quickly go and see who are the customers that we're onboarding, who is responsible for them on the team and where are they generally in this process. So things like what task are they currently working on? Um, this is a great example of a, of a pretty straightforward dashboard here, but this, this combines Arrow's customer facing data as well as HubSpot data. So who is the customer? What's their deal? Who is responsible for onboarding them? What is the status of that onboarding? When is the ideal target date? How many days until that target date? What's the current thing they're working on? Who is the person working on it? And how many days have they been on this thing? This is obviously demo data, so some of these numbers are a little wild, um, but it's also not that far from reality where you can have one customer like Wegner in this case, they've been stuck on this task for 49 days. So this serves the first purpose of giving visibility at a high level to my company, but also now as the leader of the team, I can quickly come in here and, and get a sense of what my team is up to and not from a micromanagement lens, but more of a understanding what is going on. Is this CRM hygiene that hasn't taken place? That's the first thing that might be the cause here. Like maybe Wegner actually failed onboarding and we should have been removed from this pipeline, but they weren't for whatever reason. Um, let's say they, that's not the case and this is a real customer and they are active and now it is 46 days beyond their target date. My next question would be in this case to Stuart, who is managing this onboarding, what is going on with them? So I could dig in from here right into that deal and maybe look at the, the prior history and make sense of some of the notes or the emails that have happened in there. I can open the onboarding plan itself and see if there's any comments in there. Or maybe they made progress on future tasks and this one for whatever reason is the one they're stuck on. Um, if Stuart tells me, nope, this is all fine, They're, this, these are actually real numbers, they just really are stuck on this, then it's, now we're getting into the category of, okay, there's something here that we can probably optimize. My next question would be to dig into that specific task in, few, in um, historic onboardings and see, did other people take this long? It usually doesn't take this long to gather a list of team members, um, or is this just unique to this person? So. If it's unique to them, again, like why? Is there a better way to do this? Either way, I have to get this information. Either way, we can say that this process or plan didn't work, and now I have to gather this list of teams. So it helps me at a high level provide visibility, and then it lets me problem solve at an individual customer level at the lowest end. So either way, I have to figure out how to get this stuff from this customer. I'm gonna go do that, whether it's creating a new plan, reminding them that something is due, sending a one-off email, whatever it is. And then in between those two ends is fixing the process if something is broken. Is this task in the wrong place in this plan? Is this unique to certain sets of customers and not all customers? Maybe this isn't a generic task that everyone needs to be responsible for. And maybe that's the learning in here. Um, maybe for this specific customer, it was unclear. Maybe they did it and they just didn't mark it off on their plan or mark it as complete. Or maybe this doesn't apply to them. Whatever, whatever the why is I now have to go figure that out and ultimately get this moving. Um, the other thing I like about these views to, to kind of keep expanding on Stuart's question is even in this top one, you can kind of see what's missing. But the next, the next big question usually people have is how long is onboarding taking and how many customers are kind of stuck in that world or who's responsible for them. This is where pipelines become highly advantageous and we use, this is just out of the box HubSpot reporting, but we have a pipeline time in stage report here and we use pipelines to manage our onboarding process and our sales process and implementation process and all those pieces. Um, our stages inside of those kind of correlate to where they are inside of their arrows plan. So then we can automate movement through here. But this now helps me learn or answer the question of how long is onboarding actually taking? Um, this will obviously depend on your process. This will change a little bit as you change tasks and change templates. So take it all with a grain of salt. 
but it's very helpful directionally to start to get themes out of data like this. So the, the thing I'm noticing in that report specifically is I have a ready for onboarding stage, if you scroll down a little bit. And on average, again, bear with me that this is, this is uh, demo data, but on average, customers sat there for 10 days. That is, if I'm looking at that as a success leader, that's horrible. These customers were ready to go and they've been sitting in this bucket for 10 days. So I don't even care that these other stages take 50, like I, even if I have SLAs on there, that is not a concern for me anymore. It's trying to figure out why are customers sitting around for 10 days without getting movement? Is it because we don't have a process? Are people not sending them their plans? Is it a team gap? Is it a handoff gap? What is that that's happening? Um, then if you scroll a little bit further down, now I have some revenue information. So I like to know how much physical money is sitting inside of onboarding. When you're using deals or tickets, deals specifically has a revenue component to them. Tickets, you can add a property that houses that revenue. But ultimately, I want to know who on the team is onboarding customers. What's the value of those contracts or the value to the business? Because if they churn, that's potential revenue lost. If we retain them and grow them, that's potential lifetime value that we can build on. Um, the next graph to the right here is things like how many customers is each person working on. This helps me think about bandwidth and size and assignment roles and, and all that. Um, the, if you keep scrolling down a little bit, then I have a, this is a HubSpot task report that lets me build tasks depending on where customers are. In this case, I've been doing my job. I only have one customer that needs a handoff, but you can basically trigger these tasks based on any sort of information that comes from arrows. In our case, so like if a customer completed their schedule call, maybe I have an internal task to go prepare an agenda or prepare a deck or something like that. Um, and then finally, the last thing that I love using data for, we, we kind of touched on the stage bit, but this last report down here is what I call a missing information report, or in this case, an important information report. But ultimately what I'm highlighting are deals or tickets that are ready for onboarding but are missing some pertinent information that I need. So that whole piece about aligning on goals, we like to actually collect that information in sales and we list it as a success metric. And here are five customers that recently got hit to the stage ready for onboarding or beyond and maybe have potentially already started our onboarding process. And in HubSpot, we are missing their success metric. So what that means is we have to we have to fill that out. There's a filter behind this report that will remove them from this report if they don't have that information because on the onboarding side and on the success side, I don't want my teams or myself to have to go constantly ask customers the same question over and over and over again. I would rather confirm it. So when I look at this, I see five accounts who we're missing that information for. We might have that and the field might not have been filled out in marketing or in sales or in onboarding. So again, this is internal. Um, if we don't have that, that's an opportunity to fix the process. Why, why is this information missing from these deals? Was there a theme there? Was it the same person that sold them? Were they self signups? Was it a form inside of our demo request or our marketing flows that was missing that information? Um, was there some sort of workaround that we didn't know about or think about? Was this not a required field? So really unpacking the process. The value is either way, I know I have to get this information from these five people. That is regardless of the process that's broken. Um, customers, like I mentioned earlier, as far as they're concerned, they don't care that I'm missing this in my CRM and it's not their problem. So I have to figure out where this answer lives, where to figure this out, how to fill in this, this actual answer. Going forward, I have to have this anyway. Um, and I love having different cuts of this type of report where basically it's a lot of the same information. We're just using filters to say, is property A missing? And then use that to, to create different views of it. So any sort of information that you need throughout your process, things like their goals, things like their, their target dates for launching, that should essentially all live inside of your CRM where other people also have visibility and access to it. And reports like this, where you pair HubSpot information with Arrows information or other um, tools that you might be integrating, lets you quickly identify those gaps, again, without having to, the customer, as far as they're concerned, have the plan and they're going. They, they don't care that I'm missing this. But either way, I have to figure this out. So I will figure this out, fill in the information. Once, once that information is filled out on a customer, they drop off of this report and I can keep chugging along. Um, in an ideal world, all these reports are blank. All of my information is living there. Everyone knows every answer. It's already in the CRM. Um, 
in, in most of our worlds and most of our realities, that's not the case. So leveraging reports like this and leveraging a tool like Arrows that can take a process, bring it to life, put it in front of customers, and then give you information about it in a centralized location where most people are looking for that anyway is ideal. Um, I am sure many of you are constantly slacked or get the question of what is, where is this process in, or where is this customer in the process? What happened to that deal I closed, especially as we hit the holidays or year end or revenue ending cycles? Um, people want to know where their deals are. People want to know where their customers are. Setting up those dashboards, setting up those reports, setting up those automations between handoffs won't solve all your problems, but they will definitely solve most of them and alleviate a lot of those pain points and, and in time improve the customer experience, which is ultimately all of our goals anyway. And that in turn improves your internal processes over time. Yeah, for sure. I think that's a great point. I think something that we think about a lot, which, whichever tool you're using, having a process that you're putting in front of a customer that is able to set expectations um, and keep the customer aligned on where they're heading and what's next when you're not physically with them on a call or you know uh, going back and forth in email um, is it, really helpful in sort of smoothing out any missing pieces, any gaps, any uh, sort of uh, non-ideal situations in your own process. Um, the customer doesn't necessarily need to see, see all that. Um, as far as they're concerned, they, they have what's next and they can keep making progress. Um, if anybody has any questions, we can, we can of course, dive into, uh, into those. Um, but otherwise, we will be sending out the recording uh, for this, for the breakdown of, of building the plan, um, the, the sort of steps to go through to optimize uh, that for action. Um, and and we'll, we'll get that out um, in the next day or two. Um, but Sherelle, anything uh, on... Uh, on your side that you would add, I, I know there's some interesting, you talked about it as we're going through the plan, but uh, what's been the biggest uh, thing for you? I guess we, we have a question here. Uh, resources, people new to the world of onboarding and success. Yeah, um, um, great question. I'm doing a couple of things. Let me, I'm putting mine and Stuart's LinkedIn information in here. Um, Follow us, connect with us there, add us, and then we can always jump into these topics. We, we, us two genuinely love talking about this. So if you ever want to go a little bit deeper, we're happy to connect directly that way. Um, I also share those because Stuart is putting out a lot of content that starts to answer that question above of any good resources, books, blogs that kind of introduce this. I'm also going to do a, um, I'll call it a selfish plug. It's not really selfish. One of the things I wrote when I started was how, when I started Arrows, um, was basically a guide on why early stage companies and founders should care about the topic of customer success and onboarding. And really it's just a collection of things I've read, experiences I've learned, and I've tried to put it more in layman's terms as to why people should care about it. And then the later chapters do get into more details. It's a completely free resource. You can view it on that link I just sent you. You can scroll through the website. If you want a cleaner, downloadable PDF version of it, drop your email in there and Stuart will send it to you. Um, but the other place I'll point you is our blog. And again, this is less about driving you to, this is not intended to like drive you to our content by any means. The way we come up with this content is Stuart does interviews all day long with other CS leaders. And then I am obviously talking and my team is talking to a lot of our customers who are coming to us for onboarding and customer success. And this is accumulation of all those stories and those resources. Um, Stuart has a happy customers newsletter that goes out every week. And it's literally just lessons and learnings that he is picking up from other CS folks and other leaders. And we try to make every piece of content or every template that we put out usable and tangible and something that you can turn around and physically learn from. Um, so that's why I'm pointing you there. We don't gate anything. We try to not request your, we're not trying to bait and switch you into giving us your contact information to then turn around and send you something in exchange that then is more clickbait. Like we try to genuinely put out content that we would use that's coming from the space of we have done so much research and spent so much time trying to find good content on these topics and not that there isn't good content out there. There's not great free content out there. So that's what we are trying to do with those resources. Um, 
So start there for whoever's asking that question. And then by design, we've tried to not go super detailed on these topics because they are so unique and huge, but almost every piece of content we put out is, is more than enough to give you a high level understanding of what it is, start to give you tangible examples of how to set it up or how to think about it or how to calculate it if it's a number. Um, and then from there, if you ever want to go deeper, hit us up, follow us on LinkedIn, send us an email. Um, my email is Sherelle at arrows.to, Stuart's is Stuart at arrows.to. Um, so we will dig into your questions from there. Yeah, I think the, the other resources, uh, there are a lot of CS communities that are very good, gain, gain grow, retain. Um, some of the good one that's pretty active. Um, customer success groups on LinkedIn are generally are pretty active. I think that's one observation that uh, I've had in the last year or so is that you know folks in the customer success community are generally very open and happy to, uh, happy to help. Um, so this would be a couple that I would point to. Um, this, the question about uh, integration costs. So Arrows, depending on uh, your usage, depending on your tiers, starts at around $300 a month. Um, I would definitely recommend if you're interested in Arrows, the product, um, for, for onboarding plans connected to HubSpot, um, we can drop the uh, link to, to schedule some time um, to, to chat through what that might look like specifically for, um, for you and for your team. Um, but typically starts around three hundred dollars a month, and again, dep really depends on your usage, the the data that you're pushing back and forth um, to top spot. But to give you sort of a ballpark starting point. Um, but yeah, we will accept. Like we will send out the recording. Any other questions? Sure, I'll drop our, our LinkedIn uh, profiles there. That's a good place to, to connect with us. But otherwise, send us an email. Always happy to help. Generally, try to be really generous and, and sort of helpful uh, as a, a value at arrows. Um, so if you have any questions at all, um, please do let us know and we will help anywhere that we can. But thank you so much uh, to everybody for, for joining us. Sherelle, thanks for, for being here in between customer calls. Um, and we'll see everybody again soon. My pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Good luck and let us know how we can help.